I'd like to call to order the regular Board of Education meeting for the Fort Mall School District. If you would stand, please, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Be seated. Ms. Brain will call. Tom. Yeah, thanks. John. Eric. Mike. Yes. Erica. Here. Gabriel. Here. And the notes will uh, mark that Craig Moore is on excuse day. Yes, thank you very much. All right. I need a motion for the adoption of the agenda that you have before you tonight. I move for approval of the agenda as presented. Mr. Callahan, second, please. Powers. Powers, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. All right. Uh, comments from the audience? I have a couple that uh, we'll be reading that have come in over the, uh, the web online. And we have a couple that are here in person tonight. Um, first one is Arnie Dinoff. Hello, Fallon, if you want to come forward, please. And just a reminder to our speakers that there is a five minute uh, time limit. <clears throat> Thank you very much, members of the Board of Education. Uh, good evening. My name is Arnie C.A.C. Anastave Dinoff, a public advocate of the Fort Zumwalt School District and also a countywide public advocate. Uh, I want to talk about a few things here. Um, the first thing is the district finances. As you all know from discussions last month, the district has no deficit. There's no deficit spending. As a matter of fact, we have a surplus of money. And my question to the Board of Education is, I've asked for evidence and facts. How are you spending our taxpayer dollars? How are you spending our federal, our state, and our local contribution from real property taxes? Uh, Right now, the St. Charles County Assessor reassessed real property. I open up my tax bill. This is done every two years per state law. My reassessment ends up to be an additional, in 2021, an additional $573 from the money that we pay currently. 425 of that new revenue is going to go to the Fort Zumwalt School District. So you times that times the 30,000 households you're going to have a, a landmine of money coming in of cash flow. Now, residents can ask for an informal conference hearing with the county assessor staff to go over the assessment and make sure that they're comparing apples to apples and not comparing apples to bananas. So if you disagree with the assessment of the county staff, the appeal process uh, by the third Monday in July of this year, you can file an appeal with the County Board of Equalization. That's three members of our community who will hear your appeal. If you disagree with that, you can take it to the State Tax Commission. And I plan on doing that because eating that $573 tax increase is pretty hard to swallow. Now the district, it was made whole, plus some money from the federal government by the governor's release of hundreds of millions of dollars to local school districts. We went from being in deficit spending to now a surplus for the next school year, and we're in great financial shape, according to the State Auditor's Office and according to the Office of Financial Responsibility in the Missouri Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. But yet you wanted to ask me and my fellow residents for a huge tax increase that Dr. DeBray wanted 79 cents for 100 cents evaluation. Then it was rolled back to 39 cents that we saw on April 6th and was soundly and resoundly defeated by our residents. Our residents are smart. Now the state appropriation to the school district, to, uh, to the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is very whole from the state legislature, if signed by the governor, which will go into effect for this fiscal year, which starts July 1st. Now the uh, deal that was made with the House and the Senate Committee is 30% reimbursement for transportation costs, kind of, you know, it's a little bit more than what we got this year. Uh, and so we're looking at an increase in 
transportation costs from Dusty and from the state legislature. Now, state house and state Senate bills that have been truly and finally passed, I just want to go through uh, that with you. Um, I ask on some of these tax bills, uh, especially the one that we all know about, which is a all out uh, attack on public education and trying to make public education private, which we each uh, house bill 349 passed or sponsored by Chris uh, Phil Cristofanelli here in St. Charles County, which has established the Missouri Empowerment Scholarship Accounts Program, which is giving tax credits to residents in lieu of paying real estate taxes. And there's a whole caveat of different things that this bill does. But I would ask that you lobby our governor and uh, to not sign this bill. And please send your emails to Tammy, T-A-M-M-Y dot Ali, A-L-L-E-E -E, at governor.mo.gov. Uh, some of the other issues that I'd like to go over, uh, Senate Bill 86. 30 seconds creates new provisions prohibiting the use of public funds to influence elections. And that's what our school district is not gonna be allowed to spend any money for public education any longer. Uh, House Bill 685 lowers the minimum age requirement instead of 24 years for Board of Education to 21 years. The bill establishes, or uh, House Bill 362, this bill establishes the Government Lending Transparency Act, which is reported to a database which will be maintained by the Office of um, Auditor and State Treasurer, and HB 271 establishes the Missouri Local <coughs> Government Expenditure Database. Can I have a few more minutes to go over uh, this? No, we've got a long meeting tonight. So. Can I ask for a vote of the board to finish this? This is very important state legislation that really affects our school district. Um, sure. Can I have a vote to yeah, the board to, the board to go through these bills really quick? How much time do you need? Probably a minute, minute and a half. Just Take a minute, but let's not go along this. Well, it's very important that you be educated no, as absolutely. elected officials and know what was truly passed and what's sitting on the governor's desk. Mr. Dino, so. we're, we're well familiar with this. So if you want to do this for the folks here in the uh, that are watching, that's fine. So please do. Um, the other bill was... Uh, uh, House Bill 271, which this bill establishes the local government expenditure database. And it's a very extensive bill. I'm still going through trying to di digest what the 14 pages of provisions are. Um, but what it basically does is it offers the district the opportunity to voluntarily be transparent and put all their financial uh, information, including bill payments, uh, bond debt service, uh, and things that you spend uh, <coughs> on the uh, public portal, which is available to the public. Um, and uh, just real briefly, uh, Senate Bill 86, uh, this creates new provisions prohibiting the use of public funds to influence elections. Uh, the district can no longer, school districts, uh, employee or agent of the school district can no longer support or oppose the nomination of election of any candidate for public office. School districts, employees, and the school districts as a whole cannot support or oppose a passage or defeat any ballot measure or uh, have a committee supporting or opposing candidates or ballot measures. And finally, it does not allow the school district to pay debts or obligations of any candidate or candidate committee previously occurred in the above um, legislation. Uh, but the one with Krista Finelli, I really ask that you really get involved because that is really starting the erosion of public education and it allows for tax credits and it's going to start taking away money from our that's from our needed uh, public sources appreciate Thank that you. The information that you shared there at the end is quite uh, quite informative and helpful to our public and i appreciate that the information on the front side however just a fact fact check the money that we that was released is one-time funds we're not going to be able to see that from time to time year after year so just so you know, and we'll the, other thing, the other comment that you made was that Dr. Debray had asked this board for a 79 cent increase, and he never did. So I just wanted to fact check that. So I want to make sure that you understand that that is. It was in the workshop when the prices were being He never discussed. asked for 79 cents. Maybe it was 69. <clears throat> Pretty close. Arnie, Mr. Dinoff. Yes, sir. I'm just, I'm just saying, when you come forward and share facts, it'd be nice to have the facts. 
Can I ask the board to entertain the possibility of passing a resolution to send to the governor, urging him not to pass House Bill 349? Mr. Deputy, we can't take. We, we can't make a motion from the floor like that. No, but you could support that motion. I can, you can make that happen. We can absolutely talk about it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next item is Alexis Bingham. <clears throat> next next speaker. If you could give us your address and your comments, please. I apologize. I'm a little nervous. Uh, Gabriel, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the board. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Alex Bingham. I'm the president of the Find the Light Foundation. May is Mental Health Month, and that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. Uh, at the first board meeting of the year, Find the Light presented the results of a preliminary survey that was conducted over Facebook. <coughs> the survey found that of 300 students who participated, 73% reported struggling with self-harm or suicide. We identified more than 80 students. Uh, since the year 2000 that have been lost to and 80 students and recent graduates who have died to, due to a mental health crisis. I graduated in 2014. Our district class has lost six classmates to suicide and overdose. My younger brother's class has lost 13. Over the last two decades, our district has lost an average of eight students per graduating class to suicide or overdose. These students are not here to share their thoughts with you. So we're here today to ask that the board listen to the kids who are still here. As several board members and Dr. Debray have observed, the pandemic has only worsened the mental health of students and teachers. But we do not yet know to what degree. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is why today on behalf of the Fort Simmel community, we are asking the board to create a committee to quantify the mental wellness of our district. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> Um, as we discussed with district leadership last week, the work of the committee would include working with students, teachers, administrators, and counselors, and would have the support and resources that we've spent this year building with the help of experts both in and out of the district and community groups to craft a pilot study that would include surveys designed to objectively measure student, teacher, and staff experience as it relates to the mental health environment of our district. Our goal with this is to proactively identify our district's strengths and its areas for growth from a student and teacher perspective that may be connected with the district's rate of uh, death by suicide and overdose. Fort Zumwalt has long been a state leader in education and prioritizing the mental health of our students and staff would only serve to better our community and our state. Our students are resilient and passionate and they deserve a school system that serves them and their health. Public schools are the number one provider of youth mental health services in the country. Schools can't be expected to shoulder this responsibility without being properly equipped with all of the information possible. <coughs> The American Association of School Administrators found that 35% of students 14 to 18 undergo a mental health crisis every year. Our research suggests that those numbers are higher both in our district and in our state. <clears throat> Only about half of those students will ever seek care. It's not enough to be reactive, we need to be proactive when we're talking about mental health. Fort Zumwalt has the opportunity to lead the state in mental <coughs> wellness of its students and staff, but it can only do so when it's fully informed of both the strengths and the weaknesses of its policies. To that end, we as a community are asking the board to sponsor a committee to measure the mental health environment in which students and staff are working and learning every day. I'll end with this. Fort Zumwalt is full of world-class teachers and students who are resilient, empathetic, brilliant, and uniquely passionate. That's something that this district is, is very successful in the passion of their students. The best way for the district to move forward and be the best that it can be is to give them an opportunity to give feedback on their district and to listen, and listen closely. It's not only the best way forward, it's the only way forward. We're very proud to be products of Fort Zumwalt, and we believe that our district can be a model for education across the state. But that starts with mental health of the students and teachers. It starts at the very lowest levels. That's where academic success is built. We look forward to following up on this request. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Alexis. I did have a couple of comments from uh, online. The first being from Teresa Davis of St. Peter's. Given the latest scale back of restrictions, would it be possible to allow the students to remove masks? If not completely, perhaps removing them from PE and recess should be considered. And finally, <coughs> uh, this is a young man, Cormac Allen. St. Peter's um, had the privilege of talking to Mr. Allen via email. Uh, dear board members, 
My name is Cormac Allen. I am a kindergartner at St. Peter's Elementary. I sent you an email about field day for virtual kids. Thank you for making my wish to go come true, but I still want all of my virtual friends and all of the virtual kids to be able to have the choice to go to. I think that all virtual kids should get to make their choice because field day is a lot of fun. It is also good exercise. They will get to see their schools and their virtual teacher. I also think they should get the choice to go because it has been a very hard year for everyone. Field day would be fun and a safe outdoor thing to end the year. Kids have, have had to give up a lot this year, like birthday parties, seeing their family going places, and other things. But field day is outside, so it can be safe, and then we don't have to give that up too. I wanted to come to talk to you in person, but I was too scared. Please think about letting everyone who is virtual come to field day, or McGowan. And then his mom, Bridget, writes, thank you, board members, for listening to Cormac. He feels very strongly that everyone deserves a chance at personal field day. I'm sorry, a chance at in-person field day. I greatly appreciate your willingness to let him express himself. He feels very strongly that kids can make a difference, <coughs> and he is hoping to make a difference for everyone with this, no matter how small it may seem. So that concludes our comments. <coughs> Uh, moving on, I need a motion to accept the consent agenda with the addendums that you have received tonight. Our second. George, all in favor, say aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, financial reports. Mr. Orr, if you could walk us through your summary. Good evening, members of the board. I direct your attention <coughs> to the monthly financial summary for the month of April. Monthly fund balance is total $91,116,908.68. Of that balance, $85,362,000. Was invested at the end of the month. Operating funds invested were $65.5 million. Bond funds were $7.5. And debt service invested total was $12.4. Monthly revenues for the month total was $12,743,132.88. We're showing the revenue reports. For the month of April, revenues from local sources totaled to 3.3 million, from state 8.1 and federal 1.3. Revenues are running 5.2 million higher year to date through April compared to the same period last year. This is due to several variances in several different areas, with the majority coming from an increase in local tax receipts that went up 3.9 million so far year to date. Other increases included 350,000 in sales tax revenue, 1.8 million in stimulus funding. 483,000 basic formula is up so far thanks to the release. Um, I would like to point out that this only looks like an increase in basic formula revenue because the prior year still had a withhold of $3 million. So since he withheld since he <coughs> this year's withhold, it's going to show us an increase in this year's revenue. So, 4.2 million early childhood revenue, and this is just a timing variant. We're actually not receiving um, early childhood revenue. It's just that we received it earlier this year than we did last year. So it shows us a positive variant. 2.7 million in additional food service revenue from federal sources. <coughs> now, this was offset by negative 2.5 million from local sources. Do you guys know? Federal government is funding all of our reimbursable meals this year, so none of our students have to pay for a full price meal or a reduced price at anything. So we, we still have some high price sales, but right now that's kind of what we stand. So the increase in federal offset by decrease in local. The negative variances include negative 411,000 in this line in Soho. We've had less great funding this year. We didn't have as many projects going on, and we had a lower insurance rate. And we also have a negative 2.7 million of non-current, which was one-time bond refunding variants. Overall, that's where we stand on revenues. Monthly expenses totaled $18,829,528.46. For the month of April, salaries totaled $11.7 million, benefits 4.2, purchase services 1.1, supplies 1.1, and capital projects 0.8. And these are all typical and about what we'd expect to see expenses about this time of year. For the year, total expenses are down by 8.8 million when we compare to last year. The bulk of the decrease is related to what we would call non-current, non, uh, which is 6.4 million less than capital expenses. We also had a debt refinancing, which accounted for the rest of the decrease, which was down 3.4 compared to last year. 
Um, debt refinancing is considered non-current expenditure and is typically one-time impact. If we exclude both capital and debt service and just focus on operating expenses, we actually see an increase of $1 million in operating costs. This is primarily related to increases in tuition costs for the virtual program, which went up by $1.8 million compared to last year. This includes both the cost of the summer school program and the regular term cost for those that chose the virtual option in their schools this year. And these increases were partially offset by other by reduced spending on contract transportation, travel, student activities, and we have some savings in ACC testing to this year. So we saved around 0.9 million. Any questions for Mr. regarding the finance report? There are none. I need a motion to approve the report as presented. Mm -hmm. Mr. Callahan, second, please. Ammons. Ammons. <coughs> uh, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Old business, facility planning. I'm going to handle that tonight. Mike, uh, Lisa couldn't be here with us. So <coughs> let me uh, discuss this for you. First of all, um, we are coming to the end of the bond issue. Um, funds that we have available. The last bond issue we passed was 2018. We've done a lot of really good work with that. Um, so we're getting down to the end. Um, I would report that the PDC Center is coming along very nicely. Um, I try to get by there uh, as often as I can. And it, it will impress you once you get a chance to be in there. Right now, the uh, completion date is in September. They're trying to improve on that. <clears throat> but we've had some uh, difficult weather and we had some uh, trouble on uh, getting some steel in due to the fact that some of that steel is coming from overseas. So it's coming along, uh, not as fast as we like, but I think we'll be in there um, no later than September. Um, so um, we want to make some difference with the money we have available. We uh, have some bid packages this evening we're bringing to your attention. There's three bid packages. The first one is J.O. Mud Elementary, which includes painting and flooring, and there's three alternates with that. Bid package two is Forest <coughs> Park Elementary, which includes some painting and flooring. And bid package three is Progress South Elementary, which includes uh, carpeted areas in the north, south, and east pods, and a couple of alternates as well that goes along with that. So. Those break down by the following categories that I want to recommend to you. The first category is painting. Um, this is a part of bid pack, pack, package number one. Jail Mud Elementary School, painting all the corridors and restrooms in the building. Um, the low bid uh, was Joseph Ward painting, and their base bid was $37,200. They had two alternates, uh, $2,200 and $5,100. Um, at J.O. Mudd, I'd like to recommend that total amount of $44,500. They are the low bid. Um, if you would like to take them separate, if you can. Um, so I need, if there's any discussion uh, or a motion for the acceptance of bid package one in J.O. Mudd Elementary for painting, awarding to Joseph Ward painting in the amount of $44,500. Callahan, second, Mr. George. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, that's accepted. Next item. Okay, also in painting, part of the package <clears throat> two was Forest Park Elementary School. Um, we are not recommending any award on this particular project. Joseph Ward <clears throat> Painting has requested to have their bid withdrawn, um, and we felt that the uh, other bid, uh, top quality, was uh, just higher than what we expected. So I need for the board to uh, allow Joseph Ward to withdraw their bid for this uh, particular project. They say that they missed some allowances in there and they just can't do the, the project for what they bid. It was much too low. So I'd recommend that you allow Joseph Ward to withdraw their bid. So for the recommendation, I need a motion to allow Joseph Ward to withdraw their bid on bid package to a first park element. George, second. Callahan, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed, like saying. Motion carries. 
Next category was flooring, and this is a JL mud again. CI Select was the low bidder on this particular project, but they have asked to have their bid uh, withdrawn due to an error in estimating. So the second low bidder was Richard A. Floor Covering Company, um, and that was for a base bid of $4,222, and alternate one in the amount of $5,843 for a total of $10,000. $65, and I would recommend that you would both allow CI Select to withdraw their bid and accept the next low bid of Richard A at $10,065. Do you have a question? I have a question, sir. Um, the, the word abatement uh, raises some questions in my mind. Are we dealing with excessive amounts of mold, or is there a risk issue here? No, whenever we talk about abatement, we're talking about asbestos. There is asbestos in the glue. Uh, it's no longer, yeah, yeah. So uh, you can't do a renovation unless you abate that asbestos. And so it's expensive to do, but we got to get rid of it. Okay. We'll be in bunny suits doing our thing. Yeah, they will. Yeah. All right, with that in mind, uh, CI Select being the low bidder, asking to withdraw their bid, uh, we need a motion to allow them to pull and to award this bid to Richard A. Floor Covering uh, for jail mud in the amount of $10,065. I move for approval. Mr. Callahan, second. Mr. Helms, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That's okay, great. All right, in like fashion, um, at Forest Park <coughs> Elementary, where we have more flooring going in, CI Select was a low bidder. They made a mistake in their estimating. They're asking the board to allow them to withdraw their bid. Uh, Richard A. Floor Covering Company is the second low bidder. The base amount for the carpeting at Forest Park Elementary is $25,368. And that would include any uh, abatement that has to take place. So $25,368. So likewise to the last motion, uh, we're gonna release the I select and award the contract to Richard A. Floor Covering for Forest Park Elementary uh, in the amount of $25,368. The terms are approved. Uh, Power second. George, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, and that motion carries. All right, the last part of the flooring category is Progress South Elementary School where we are going to do uh, extensive carpeting in the north, south, and east pod. Uh, on this one, Richard A. Floor Covering Company was the low bidder. Um, the base bid uh, was $28,417 with two alternates, one of $11,343 and one of $10,199 for a total of $49,959. Uh, uh, CNI Select was not the low bidder, but requested to withdraw their bid due to an error in estimating. So, I would, ex I would recommend that you accept Richard's bid and allow CNI to um, withdraw their bid. Does it really matter since they're not the lowest bid or anything? Yeah, they approved, <clears throat> but they requested it. So. Right. so again, likewise to the last motion, uh, I need a motion to approve Richard A. floor covering for the Progress South Elementary flooring package, and uh, we'll really see and I select from there, uh, from there. there. Mr. Callahan, second please. Mr. Helms, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Moving on to acoustical ceiling. Last item is at Jail Mud, we're doing some acoustical ceiling repair and renovation. Friend Acoustical is a low bidder for a total amount of $16,054. I'd recommend that you would approve that. Get a motion to approve uh, Friend Acoustical. Uh, for replacing the jail mud elementary uh, acoustic ceiling for the tech number one, the amount of 16,000 over the people. Uh, Ours, second. Callahan, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Uh, motion carries. Thank you very much. Very good. All right. Thank you. To the next item fifth grade one to one program updates. Uh, Mrs. Yeah. Waters? You want to bring us up to date? Yep, thank you. Um, we have with us this evening um, JB Money, our Executive Director of Technology, and Ken Dyson, who is currently serving in the role as elementary instructional coach, and that will become a permanent role for her next year, which we're really excited about. And, 
Um, they have worked really hard this year, uh, particularly second semester with our fifth grade teachers uh, to pilot a one-to-one -one program in two of our elementary schools with the hopes that it would go well and that we can roll that out for all of our fifth graders next year throughout the district. So they've put together a quick PowerPoint presentation and they're going to share uh, their findings and, and the input that they received. Maybe we're just going to talk through it. Okay, we're just going to talk through it. Yeah, right? Um, it's going to battle us tonight. So, but we don't want to take a lot of your time tonight anyway. So, um, just really quickly, we want to talk about fifth grade. Uh, in the past, <clears throat> We have brought our uh, Chromebooks that come out of our eighth grade to our fifth grade or into our elementaries in general, um, but they've just gone into carts. And what we've really found is we want our students to be more prepared for middle school. Um, and part of middle school is you get a, a Chromebook to take home, and it's yours, and you've got to take care of it. Um, with some of the struggles we have there, though, is we're asking our middle school teachers that are general ed teachers to really teach our students how to care for those devices, how to use those devices on a daily basis at home. And at fifth grade, we have the luxury of having elementary tech teachers, which are able to focus on that a little bit more. And what we'd like to do is shift a take-home one-to-one model to our fifth grade um, that will help us kind of get through some of those hurdles, make sure that we spend the time with our students that we really need to going into the program, and gives them a little bit more of a way to prep for middle school before they get bombarded with everything else around middle school. So this year's pilot program was with two of our elementary buildings, um, Rock Creek and Osman, both agreed to work with us. Before we sent those devices home, we made sure we had a very um, set plan in place. We talked with the administrators, with the librarian, the technology teacher, and all the fifth grade teachers, as well as the technicians that would be preparing the devices. Um, once we, that plan was in place, um, the principal sent out an opt-out survey, so we gave the parents an opportunity to let them know what the program um, was going to be about. We gave them the chance to opt out if they preferred their child not to bring a device home. Um, out of all of the fifth graders at the two buildings, we did have one student that opted out, um, and that student just kept the device in the classroom but still practiced charging it and making sure that they had it available and ready to go each day. Um, the teachers and the principals also met with the fifth graders and they went over the expectations for the program before they started sending them home, which was about two weeks into second semester. Um, they did have extra chargers and uh, loaner Chromebooks available for the students just in case anything happened, which of course it sometimes does. Um, and at first the students just practiced taking the Chromebooks home every night, having a place designated to charge them, and making sure they were bringing them back charged each day. Um, after that, they were able to have some extension activities and some ways that students could use their Chromebooks for educational purposes at home. Uh, halfway through this semester, we had our principals work with us to develop a survey that would be sent home to the parents to get their input and how they thought the program was going so far. We had 62 parents uh, respond. We had a combination of open-ended questions and multiple choice questions to really gather their thoughts on how successful they thought the program was so far, and overwhelmingly, the responses were very positive. Um, some of the things that we were hoping that they would gain out of this program, which was preparing for middle school, having more equity in devices, so those were the things that the parents were commenting on, so we were really pleased to see that. Um, they did have some suggestions for us of having more opportunities for students to practice the homework piece, making sure that we were giving parents all of the necessary um, expectations so that they knew what to have their child do at home. So there are certainly things that we gained from that survey as well that we are putting into place. Um, we're currently working on an implementation guide that would be used across the district so that all schools feel like they are prepared to start this program in the fall. Yeah, and I think our takeaways, you know, one of my concerns from a, a physical perspective was what kind of damage we were going to see down at fifth grade level. And honestly, they were better with them than our middle schoolers are. So, um, they are very proud of themselves they, to get to try this program. They are. And I think they, they feel special by having it. I think just having it at fifth grade out of an entire elementary school gives them a, that kind of separation. Um, and it went really well. And, and all the, the parties that we worked with continually over and over again, they said it, it was really good. We, we want to keep working on it. You know, by having it in place next year, one of the benefits is we can start from the beginning of the year with all of our elementaries developing online curriculum that's just going to make it that much more seamless for us to move forward. 
Um, do you guys have any questions for us? Any, any thoughts? So the Chromebooks that were in there, because a lot of them, the cards needed that, are those going to push down then? Yep, yeah, so we're going to move the physical cards down. We're repurposing Chromebooks every year, just like always. Um, so that's actually a benefit as well, is that we're not going to have to buy more cards to expand our usage throughout the rest of the elementary school. So next year, essentially, by moving forward with this, we'll be one-to-one third through 12 with take-home five through 12. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. So what are the expectations as far as the condition of receiving them back? So, yeah. and, if they, and if they fall below those expectations, is that something that the parents are going to have to uh, financially compensate for? Is something the district covers? Uh, what happens with that? Yep, so we'll, we'll have a very similar device protection plan like we do at the secondaries right now. So there's a yearly fee for that. Um, we generally right now kind of have a regular check-in that we ask students to bring devices down. Um, we want to implement a more formal plan for that next year, and I think fifth grade is an ideal place to, to start that as well. Um, and for that, the first incident is always free each year if you're on the device protection plan. So it's that second and forward incidents that are an issue, which also tends to be students that are going to have issues anyway is what we found. And so we work with those parents and try to reduce what we can. Um, and, but they will be ultimately financially responsible for those, those incidents as they occur after that first one. Um, at check-in, we do a review when they bring that device back to us and we, we power it on, we make sure the screen works, make sure keyboards work and all that kind of stuff, and we assess fines at the end of the year if there's any damage. The insurance program is $15? $15 a year. Uh, that's uh, half cost for those with free and reduced lunch. So it's, it's not very high. Uh, when we look at state averages, when we look at what others in the state are charging, generally they're around $20 to $25. We've kept that pretty low here and we've been successful with that. There's also, they say that the parents have to sign, and the kids have to sign, saying that, so they know all the costs and expectations up front, too. Yeah. We try. Be <laughs> part of the registration process for them. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else that we can do for you? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Um, Jen, did you have anything to follow up on that? Are you good? I, I did not. No, okay. just, we just wanted to let you know where we were with uh, Mr. Orr, you've got uh, computer lease recommendations you can bring to us? I do. Members of the board, in your packet, you have the memo for me outlining the computer lease recommendation for this year. In March, you guys approved the technology department's recommendation for next year's computer purchase. To facilitate that, I ask for uh, bids from six lenders. Had five responses, and Bank of America, as shown in the table below, is the lowest bidder at 0.7078% for the four year lease on it's $2 million, right? Just a little over for 4,061 computers, which are Chromebooks, laptops, desktops. It's, it, it brought you in March. I do have one thing that I need to point out. Um, JB came to me. Um, last week, and he, he was concerned because Lenovo called them and said they didn't know if they were going to be able to deliver based on the specs that were provided. But he's been working with Dell, and it looks like they may match Lenovo's offer and be able to deliver on time. So I just want to be aware of that. If that requires a vote, but you may have to go to the alternate there because they were one of the players. Well. Um, with that, I ask that you approve awarding Bank of America and authorize us to proceed with the final paperwork. You will notice there was a lot of legal mumbo jumbo paperwork that comes after that. But that's required for you to see and to approve because we have to get an attorney opinion to come along with. Any questions for Mr. Orr regarding the uh, release payment? If not, I need a motion to approve. Uh, Thank you. I was trying to I, I close. Bank of America. Powers. <laughs> second. Uh, Callahan? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Like sign? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Dr. Bray, uh, next item? Yes, the next item is for the board to approve the official election <coughs> results from the April 6th election. You approved the unofficial election results uh, at the last meeting, but tonight we have the official results. They have not changed from what you approved earlier. 
Uh, but interestingly enough, we have 286,199 registered voters in St. Charles, and only 28,092 voted, or less than 10%. Um, for our board uh, uh, officers, we had uh, 14,439 votes cast. Our two top vote getters, Tommy George, 4,314. Gabriel Helms, 3,542, uh, were elected to, to new three-year terms. For our uh, Proposition Strong Schools, um, for whatever reason, we had 4,000 less votes cast, only 10,195. And of those, 4,111, or 40%, were yes votes, and 6,084 votes, um, or 60%, no votes. So. Um, that's the election results. Uh, I would recommend that you would give your final approval to those official results. Need a motion to approve. Callahan, approve. second. Emmons. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, next item is the focus group recommendations. Uh, Mr. German Moore. Dr. Smith. Mr. John Barrett, there. <coughs> it's kind of working. Move this over here. <laughs> Get it out there. I'm going to try one thing real quick. Okay. We'll punt from there. <coughs> we did uh, share the PowerPoint <coughs> just a second ago with you guys, so if you want to check here and go in case we cannot get it uh, going. relief. I was worried that I was going to have to entertain you with something more than the visual graphics that we had prepared. So, um, great. I um, wanted to thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the board, and Dr. DeBray. Uh, we have, are excited this evening. Dr. Lar Smith uh, and Mr. John Barrow with us. This is a, a kind of a culmination of group work that began really uh, not just within this past school year, but uh, actually the previous school year. We uh, we we're responding really to concerns from parents um, and board members and uh, staff within our buildings with regards to um, specifically more within the elementary school, but uh, but what you'll find this evening, what we talked about within the recommendations, uh, really kind of spans uh, a little bit even beyond the, the K-5, but uh, kind of started out specifically looking at the, some of those behaviors within the elementary schools, classroom evacuations, disruptions. Uh, like I said, that was really a couple of years ago, and then this past year, uh, with uh, one of Dr. Bray's board priorities, it was to, to get this group together again and, and begin to kind of problem solve and collaborate and see see what we could come up with. So exciting enough, that's really what you have in front of you is, uh, is a memo, memo to Dr. Bray and then the recommendations that the uh, focus group put forth, uh, put forth to him. So uh, we'll kind of jump back and forth between that, that memo that you have and then, and then uh, we'll get a little bit into the PowerPoint. Um, I wanted to just kind of first say, Really, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, we do have uh, one member, I think, in the yes, this track was uh, part of our part of our focus group. Um, if you look at the memo, we had uh, almost 30 individuals that were involved in this process this year that began in November. Uh, really, a wide variety of representation within the district. We had uh, parents, uh, teachers, administrators, uh, school counselors, crisis counselors, social workers, behavior specialists, um, directors. We had uh, members from the curriculum office. So really a, a, a wide uh, group and, and actually had some participation from, from school board as well. Mr. Tom Emmons, uh, Ms. Erica Powers, and, and Mr. Moore, who's not here this evening, were all a part of uh, a part of these groups. So we met in November as a large group, um, some virtual, some face-to-face, -face, and that's kind of where we kicked things off. Um, and uh, after that meeting, really, that first meeting, uh, while we, we gave out some, the three of us gave out some articles and some, and some materials, but really we wanted to just hear from, you know, kind of boots on the ground, folks in the building, 
uh, experts in the field, those that are working within these classrooms and the situations and kind of hear what their concerns were and, and, and ideas. And, and, and that was really what for me and I think our group, uh, when we kind of met behind the scenes too, outside of the meetings that we, we found that, uh, you know, some, some great ideas were generated. And, and really, I think, you know, the recommendations you have before you this evening, it's not just about kind of these will be the things that just for the next school year, but what we're seeing is some things that we can put into place that can last um, maybe for you know, years to come. So that's, that's, that is uh, absolutely our hope. Um, so I will, I will kind of jump into really, uh, we, we did some subgroup work and, and after we kind of collected uh, all of our thoughts and, and uh, well, really everybody's thoughts um, and, and took input from the groups, we, we really kind of saw some themes that began to kind of echo uh, throughout our group work um, and then we developed really three priority standards we did a survey with our group and, and and developed some priorities and then that's how we established some subgroups and did some work in those smaller groups um, and with it being virtual that was that seemed to be a little bit more manageable to do it that way uh, then came back together as a large group with uh, the recommendations you have so the uh, the second page there <coughs> I'll flip that over the group the, my small group was working with building community and uh, culture was the focus group that we had. And I'm kind of the, on your visual there, I'm the, the, uh, the outside circle. Um, and, and one of the things, and this is really something that we believe we can put in action step in this summer and, and work towards this and, and have a product really for the start of the school year. And, and, what, and this really was an idea kind of generated from a parent within our community. And um, you know, as you know, that uh, when, when we've had these classroom uh, interruptions, disruptions, maybe an evacuation of, a, of an entire class, we have a, a communication that goes out to the parents. And um, what we had kind of heard was within that communication, there really was kind of a generalized um, email that goes home and there wasn't much follow through kind of with that. So what, what uh, we intend to do is make that piece a little bit more interactive um, in that, you know, put some resources within that email to be able to, uh, to share with the parents. Um, try to open that line of communication up a little bit more and then maybe even provide some links and, and resources within that uh, which we thought you know again great idea by one of our parents and, and something that we, we feel like we can move forward with almost immediately um, my second the second recommendation from our group really focuses a little bit overlap between some of the work that John was doing um, and, and actually kind of talks a little bit about one of uh, uh, somebody who did was and here this evening talking uh, with Final Light, and that's looking at some of uh, both internal mental health resources that we have in the building, but also external, and, and kind of doing a, a bit of a comprehensive review of what, what do those services look like, both outside and inside the building, and then what can we do, kind of take some of that data and, and drive some decisions on how we support that. Could be real reallocating staff, might be a possibility, um, maybe hiring more staff, um, just one component of that. Uh, also could be looking at uh, working with the professional development uh, committee to see if, are there ways we can build capacity um, within staff. So, so that, that is, uh, was our second, uh, second group recommendation. And as John will say later, there's a, a bit of an overlap with his as well. And then I, I talked a little bit about the data piece and, and one thing that we're, we would like to do. And again, this was just driven right organically from our group was, uh, you know, begin to develop both district surveys and build them building climate surveys. We do a little bit of that, probably more with our staff and not so much with, with parents, but also with students. Um, we would like to do a little bit um, on, on that front as well. Um, and John will get into look to this a little bit later, but one of those recommendations that we want to uh, take to you guys this evening is, is a, a data resource um, collection kind of uh, software that we think is really going to fit the bill, not just for this recommendation, but but maybe for some other ones too. So, so that was my group. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Smith. She's going to kind of go inside the pyramid there. So, All right. thank you. So, before I talk about my subgroup, um, I just wanted to bring your attention to the triangle in the center of the circle that Jeremy spoke about. In the education world, um, for several years now, we are accustomed to looking at a triangle and what it represents is all of our students. And so um, likely you've heard about RTI, response to intervention or multi-tiered systems of support. Often the triangle is used to represent exactly that, tiers of support. Usually it is 
green, yellow, and red. It can be in different configurations, but that usually represents RTI or MTSS. And when you look at that, R starts with the larger per portion first. And what that represents is that when we teach a concept or curricular objective, what we know about kids is that if we've done it well, about 80% of them are going to get it the first time with that good instruction presented up front. The yellow represents about 15% that might need some additional supports. And in RTI and MTSS, that's referred to as tier two. So that's about 15% of the kids. And the red represents kids who might need even more support might mean smaller groups, might mean more frequency, different types of lessons, but that should be about 5% or might be about 5%. So when we looked at the recommendations, organically, we all took a step back and looked at all kids. So while this might have started with a bit of a narrow focus about kids who are really struggling, as educators, the team knew we had to take a step back and, and talk about what have we taught, specifically taught, just like we have content area curricular objectives, have we yet taught the social emotional learning objectives? So that's where my group came in. We focused specifically, specifically on social emotional learning and a curriculum or a program because immediately we talked about holding kids accountable for things they haven't yet been taught. So we noted after doing some shared reading that we really need to explicitly instruct our students on those concepts, social emotional learning. Some kids come to school with it, some do not. Um, however, we do feel it is our responsibility. So as a team, we identified five components of whatever curriculum or program we were going to adopt. And those are shown there. We want it to be evidence-based so that it's not just any program, but it's one that's been proven to work. We wanted a, pro a program or a curriculum that would involve our families. We wanted to be able to integrate it into everything we do. So it's not just a separate part of the day, but it is everything that we do. We wanted for it to encompass professional learning for our teachers and our staff. And then also something that could be brought up with the kids through middle school and high school. So we um, then brought those uh, recommendations to Dr. DeBray. And as you may or may not be aware, five of our schools currently have Leader and Me present in our elementary schools. Leader and Me embodies the recommendation components that we had referenced without coming to the decision that we wanted Leader and Me. We just talked about what we wanted. And Leader and Me does fit that, and it is also already present. So our group had um, come up with that idea, and, and that is actually what we think would be phenomenal for our kids to continue that through the rest of our elementary buildings. John? Uh, good evening. My name is John Barrow. Um, I have the privilege of working with the early intervention, I mean early identification and intervention group. And this group focused on, um, really we were talking about the young kids um, coming in that were having the explosive behaviors was one of the priorities that, that rose. And so, um, out of that, the highlights from the kindergarten transition recommendations include just looking at aligning between early childhood and elementary, kind of expectations, how instruction's delivered. Another thing they talked about is um, some of our schools are already doing this. Um, Mark um, Schultz at Hawthorne, who was part of our group, they've been doing what they call a soft opening, which means just like every other place, try to gather some information before finalizing classroom placements for kindergarten kids so we can make sure we get the best mix. How they do that is they take the first week of school, kids are kind of in, in mixed groups, they're collecting information, doing observations. After that week, they gather that information, make those class placements, then begin to build the community. Um, the other one is registration questions and actually for implementation when we talk about next this can be rolled into what we're talking about for screening it's really just adding some questions just about early learning experiences um, for, for our incoming kindergartners so that we have an idea about what they've already experienced or not how that's gone for them <clears throat> the next place we were talking about is um what i alluded to is screening so this is um just having kids tell us what they're thinking how they're feeling 
getting teachers to report on the younger kids who can't do that themselves, getting information from parents about anything that the student might be struggling with at, at school, I mean, at home. The whole idea behind that is just so that we can identify kids early. We don't wait for the big meltdown. Um, we can start to step in and provide some supports, maybe at an earlier point before um, a crisis strikes. Um, with that, um, having an SEL or SEB screener alone, you can't just use one data point. So the idea is that we would add that with the other data that's already available to us, just looking at discipline, office referrals, attendance, those, that kind of information as well. And we want to do it at least a couple of times a year so that we're not missing anybody. Kids kind of change, circumstances change over the years. The next one is what um, Jeremy was talking about in terms of there was a little bit of overlap between um, the culture climate group and uh, this group. And really what we're talking about is how are we aligning and getting a, a solid continuous supports for all of our kids needs. So that means our partnerships with community agencies, as well as just how we're providing services and, and intervening at appropriate times for kids. The tricky part with this is just making sure that schools have uh, what they need in order to match those needs, um, the, the intervention to those specific needs. And the other part is just tr some training along with that. How do, how do you use the data and information in order to um, get down to the root of what's going on and be able to um, apply interventions to that? So the last part is probably gonna take uh, a little bit more study. And this is really around what do we do for those kids that come in that just are so far away from what those expectations and those developmental standards are for behavior at that early at that early going and so what we want to do is try to develop something that's responsive and flexible for those kids needs that's intense enough to support them but we want it to be supplemental we don't want it to be someplace that they end up just going we want to make sure that we're giving them the skills learning the routines the expectations so that we can start to integrate them back with their peers as they're ready to do that we don't want to set it up as a one size fits all kind of program. So once again, we want to use the student information so that we can be responsive and start to decrease those supports as the student starts to demonstrate those skills. So moving from the recommendations to thinking about what are we going to do with this? Um, we have a timeline and it's a, it's a pretty aggressive timeline. We have out of those eight um, recommendations, um, combining the one from Jeremy's group and the one that I worked with, we have seven projects, basically. And out of those seven projects, um, we can implement four of them next year, which is um, it's pretty good for kind of, we're talking about um, K-5 district-wide. So, um, and then we have three that are gonna take a little bit of study and some time with like a phase one implementation the following school year. And so those things that we can we can do um, out of the gate with some, with the right support is we can get a climate survey going. We can get that out, um, as Jeremy said, to um, students, staff, families, start to gather information about the community, how it's going. Um, we can do the classroom evacuation, as Jeremy said, pull those things together, get that done. We can um, do the screening. We can set that up so that we can start identifying kids after uh, the teachers get a chance to get to know them as the, as the year starts. And we can get um, the problem solving pieces together probably by January at the latest. The other ones that are gonna take more work are the, the SEL curriculum, um, talking about the, the soft opening, that kindergarten transition piece, and then the, the intense intervention going to have to do some learning, some work, some design around those things. Um, what would enable us to do the climate survey, the screening, and the um, problem solving? We'll need a little bit of technical support for this because this uses data. Um, it's collecting data. It's um, providing it in a way that school teams can analyze it um, quickly after it's received. And so there is a kind of a unique product out there that actually meets all three of those, um, uh, those needs that we have out of these recommendations. It's something called Panorama Education. And um, so that's something that, um, yeah, we might be talking about later. So you guys have anything to add? That's all I got. Dr. Nuri? No,
we had questions or I know I think to this evening really the point of it was to, was to put together the information with regards to the recommendations that uh, that the focus group you know had for the board had for Dr. DeBray um, and I think following John's timeline there the group's timeline we were looking to possibly within the next meeting bring some some of those components that we want to get started on right away for the next school year so that would probably look a little bit more uh, in depth for you guys for next year but 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 truly really, I I mean it was a it was an exciting process for us to be a part of I, I think um, you know again this was conversation that began really probably two years ago with with the board and I, and I think it was was great for us to pull together these resources that we have within the district to, to develop these recommendations. So pretty yeah, proud of I it. think the exciting thing about it is they do have some good recommendations and we will have some federal stimulus money that ask the federal government asked us to set aside a certain portion of that to to use for I think it's recovery activities. I think uh, what they're talking about, the software platform and and the Leader in Me, becoming a Leader in Me district that would allow all of our elementary schools to embody the Leader in Me curriculum. Um, I think those that, that amount of money is not gonna be exceptional, but I think we can pay for that from some of the stimulus money that we're gonna have available. So that's exciting that you can get recommendations that we actually can make happen. The other thing I think uh, that's worth pointing out is that from two years ago, where we are today in terms of classroom evacuations are about half. So uh, I think we're learning how to deal with some of these situations better than what we did before. Um, we are educators and, and we learn as, as thing goes on. What we need now is the data to help us identify and uh, uh, categorize some of the problems that, that we're having. So this is not pie in the sky. This is something we can make happen. And I think we're, gonna, we're going to uh, see some, some real results even beyond what we've seen now. So I think, I think the committee has done really good work and come up with some good recommendations. And you know, we commit to, to the board that we're going to carry forth and, and we're going to continue to improve on the problems. Do you see with the surveys, I want to clarify, this is going to be for all levels. So we're doing the surveys, correct? But it's not just K-5, we're doing it in all levels with our students, yeah, our we, staff. The, I think what we have put together for Dr. Bray is kind of two, pla not two platforms, probably two bids. bids for that, yeah, for both. So we can kind of take a look at both of them, but yes. Because I, mean, I think that's, we definitely need to have that. Yeah. Before doing, we need to look at all levels with it. And then when we do get that information, will we also be in a position because we're going to need, we will need more staff with it. Is that with all that, that we'll need more staff to fill those positions when the stuff comes back? Yeah, I think that's further it? down the road. How far down do you think that would be? Oh, I think once we get started, we'll, it'll help us determine what our timeline is, our final, final timeline. And that data that we receive will help us to make really well informed decisions right. about where and what kind of staff. Right. Well. Right. <clears throat> yes, sir. Uh, uh, just uh, two comments I would like you to recap, John. Uh, this social and emotional learning program will have family involvement very on and in depth and continuous. And second, would I expect to see earlier establishment and the definitization of IEPs for children that need it. So the family involvement question, yes, mm -hmm. I, I believe the training from the very beginning talks about how to infuse the skills that are learned at school and carry over to at home. And I think our families in Leader and Me schools have experienced that. So I'm very hopeful for a big yes for that one. Um, speeding up the process for students with IEPs, is that what I, yes. you're asking? Um, when students are, um, if the district suspects that a student has a disability, then, then we have an obligation to initiate that. Um, but we also have an obligation to try to teach a student and make certain that they're not just delayed or just haven't yet been taught those skills. So the adoption of this program could 
assist some students in being able to be better acclimated to the classroom setting and then allow us to intervene knowing that they've already learned some of those social emotional skills. So does that answer your question? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Can I add something to that too? Some of the kiddos don't qualify for an IEP too. So some of the stuff that we talked about, the hope is that if we can catch them early on and you know get them doing all this stuff and be able to recognize what's going on and have more control of their emotions, that that will help them going forward so they wouldn't, if they wouldn't qualify later on, they wouldn't need an IEP. Or for the kiddos that don't qualify for an IEP at all, that we're addressing those needs because those are just as important. So that hopefully will balance that, you know, when we're doing all of those from different avenues. Are you going to say something? Uh, I would, yes. Thank you, first, all three of you. I know that you give a lot of nights for this. Obviously, we take effort. We have a 15 month plan in front of us. Probably going to track a little longer. 15, 16 months ago, we would have never been able to expect the kind of potential issues that we're now experiencing. The question I really have is how do we keep this fresh as we go? How do we keep this updated? How do we continue to have some engagement from some of the same people, maybe other people, to ensure that this plan over the next 16 months stays current? And we're not addressing the issue that's already passed us by. I think the training that's going to happen to become a leader in the district at the elementary level is going to keep that forefront. So we'll, in our buildings, uh, the folks that already have it will have the opportunity to refresh and those folks who are new to the program get to learn it. Um, so I do think over the next school year we'll be learning how to implement and then the following year implementing. So that's going to keep it right there at the forefront as we're learning more. And what we know about educators is as soon as you start to have the conversation, there's lots of folks that go out there and start to do the early learning and start, and start to do good work before it even starts. Um, and then I do think that the ongoing surveys are going to help us to keep this at the forefront. So we'll have a year of survey data before we actually implement Leader in Me. So we'll have a baseline. And then if we can, as we continue implementing both the surveys and the program, that data will continually be refreshed. So I think we're going to continue to look at our data, watch how it trends, and decide where to go next based on that. Yeah, and I, I was going to just follow up with that because I think you know, bring up a good point, Tom, too, that really after the after we put these together, we actually asked the 30 members on the committee, hey, if anybody would be interested interested in continuing this work on with you know, developing the leader in me, or like within my group, I, I had four of them in general. So yeah, put me on that. I want to continue on with it. So I think even our immediate group, but we had, I mean, we have 20 plus people that said, yeah, we want to keep going. You know, so it wasn't just about kind of sitting down this year and, you know, going through this, but rather they want to be a part of that, which is, you know, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Would you recommend that we keep that group going? and continue that group to kind of focus on not just the elementary, but also middle school and high school, or would it be a slightly different mix at each of those levels? It probably, I would foresee it be a little, a little bit different only because you're, we're going to need more folks within those buildings in, in order to get, uh, you know, to get that buy-in. Um, but I, I absolutely think that uh, the, the group that we had together can, you know, would, if they volunteer to, that, yeah. I mean, for my group, I'll take all the help I can get. So, yeah. As we start talking about the issues that are impacting the children as they get older, we'd love to see us bring more of those children in. Yeah. As they reach the right ages and be able to help support that process. Yeah, yeah, you bet. So, <clears throat> the prospect of becoming a leader in the district is exciting to me. I've seen the leader in me in some of the just, you know, a couple of the elementary schools that we have currently. And, uh, you know, I. What, what I've seen, what I've noticed in the kids that are in the leader in these schools, they seem to have maybe a stronger foundation of what is expected and how to perform. Um, kind of an analogy, I guess, that all of our students may be tomato plants, but this leader in me is that steak that kind of holds them up, uh, and allows them to bring forth good fruit, you know. So that's a pretty layman's term of trying to draw a picture, but um, that's what it's, it's very exciting yeah. that, that, that we're going down that path because I think that it's going to really benefit all of our kids. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you say it, Mike, because one of our principals who's leading me in the leader in me building, she made a point at our first meeting to talk about 
you know, kids coming back into the year with all the different, you know, COVID protocols and expectations and everything. And what she kind of fell back on with, with her particular building was what she noticed with kids was just, there was this resiliency there because they had this kind of established routine. You know, they had they had that language down, they had, so um, she really saw, like, she had a lot of probably consternation and worry about what that might look like. And these kids came back and just hit the ground running, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that kind of speaks to exactly what you're saying. Well, thank you for your, yeah. all your hard work. Thank you guys. Everyone in the committee, and it's been really very, very enlightening. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to new business, uh, Dr. DeBray. All right, we have Paul Becker here, our director of student nutrition services. And this is this is a little earlier than he normally does this, but we need to get ready for next school year with the establishment of our lunch prices and breakfast prices and also uh, the vendors that are going to provide all the food for them to prepare the, for the, the meals for the students. So all do your usual good work. Dr. Bray and members of the board. Um, so one of the bright spots, I guess, the pandemic for the school year was free meals for the breakfast and lunch. And again, this was extended into the 21-22 school year. So very exciting that kids don't have to worry about um, coming to school if they wouldn't pack a lunch, um, parents that are busy trying to get back to work, uh, driving to the, their, their businesses instead of staying at home. So I thought this was an awesome opportunity for our, our families and, and uh, the students in our district. So this portion of it is just saying our lunch prices for, this is if the kids got second meal. So their first meal is already paid for. So a lot, you know, a lot of times our secondary kids just say, I just want an entree. And we're saying, go back, grab fruit and vegetable and we'll make it free. But if you want something more than that, you just have to pay for it. So these are our second meal prices. Um, so elementary breakfast would be $1.70. Elementary lunch, two sixty. dollars Secondary breakfast, $1.70. Secondary lunch, two eighty. dollars Adult breakfast price, $1.85. And adult lunch price, $3.45. Again, we are still the lowest um, prices in St. Charles County. Uh, since I've almost been here, we've always kept it as low as possible uh, for the families in our district to be able to afford it. It takes a lot of hard work and for our staff to make sure they're very efficient in order to do that. So I'm always proud to bring this to the board to be the lowest in St. Charles County. That's the same as this year. Correct. Right. So no price increase. So <clears throat> I think that's fantastic. I need a motion to approve the breakfast and lunch price recommendation of no change for the 21-22 school year. Mr. Helms, second, please. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item. Um, these are our, our bids and requests for proposals for next school year. So the things that we send out for uh, that we want uh, pricing on to, to, to hopefully get us to keep us competitive within the market. As you know, prices have been going up grocery stores, uh, anything oil-based products uh, with, with uh, plastics and gloves, all those things. So we have to take our increases no matter what, and there's not a whole lot of players in the market if, as they used to be because, uh, you know, this is or we're not expanding during the pandemic. So uh, I brought together, you can see the winners of, of the each section. I'm not sure, um, Mr. Swarong, if you want to take them all at one time or if you want to do them each separately, individually. Um. Probably should do them in separate. I'd like to do them the same time. Okay. Let's do them separate. Sure. Okay. So beverages, we went up with three different vendors, um, Coke, Pepsi, and Cole Wholesale. Uh, Pepsi was our lowest bid. They were our vendor from the last couple of years. Uh, their price was still a 3.3% increase. I recommend Pepsi for the 2021-2022 school year. For the recommendation, I do motion to approve. Uh, Our second. Callahan, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thanks, guys. Groceries are is our a, a cold bid was our for our groceries. Uh, their price increase was 4.5 percent. Uh, no other vendor put in for that. No other distributors. Uh, we sent to U.S. Foods, Graves Menu Marketing, uh, two major players in, the, in Missouri, and uh, no one else wanted to take uh, the size of the district we are um, in, in uncertain times. So 4.5 um, percent um, is is a little high, as in considering that. Um, that we normally wouldn't get that kind of increase, but considering today's market and the market fluctuations of prices, I do consider it fair. I remember too, I don't believe that they gave us much if any of a, an increase last time. They, yeah, you're correct. It was less than 2%. Okay. So, uh, per the recommendation uh, made on whole, whole wholesale for the grocery, you need a motion to approve. Uh, 
Powers second. George, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Next item. Uh, dairy was sent to, uh, only sent back by two different vendors, Prairie Farms, which Prairie Farms bought out Dean's Dairy, and so they're now one big conglomerate. Uh, Coal Wholesale was our other vendor, and Prairie Farms was the lowest bid, and they were only a 1% increase uh, over last year. So per the recommendation, Prairie Farms uh, would be our dairy provider at 1% of an increase. I need a motion to approve. Ours. Ours. Callahan, all in favor say aye. Uh, our bread bid um, this was sent out again um, to a number of different vendors only coal wholesale and alpha baking returned that bid uh, alpha baking has been with us the last couple years last year there was a no price increase this year was a two percent uh, they do they deliver to us fresh bread each week uh, coal wholesale wouldn't deliver us frozen but even though Alpha was still the lowest bid. So my recommendation for 21, 22 school year would be Alpha Baking. The recommendation is Alpha Baking at a 2% increase. I need a motion to approve. Mr. Cohn, second. Aye. Powers, all in favor say aye. 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 And the next one is uh, disposable bids. Uh, these items we bid by line item. So mm -hmm. we take all these items into our warehouse, the cheapest where we can find them. Um, the four places that won these different line items, which is roughly over 100 different items, Cole Wholesale, Edward Don, Industrial Soap, and Daxwell, each won a respected number of, of line item bids for disposables. Take that as a, um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, pizza, this is a delivered pizza that we, we have students, and we really use utilize this as a treat for the kids um, that is nice for them, something that would have within the local community. We sent it out, we sent it out to uh, Domino's, Papa John's, um, and Pizza Hut, and Pizza, or um, Domino's was the only one that did, and there were actually a 7% decrease from last year. So I'm wrecking Domino's uh, for our 21-22 school year. The recommendation is down those at a 7% decrease. I need a motion to approve. Holmes, second. Callahan, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. And finally, apparel company provides uniforms, uh, you know, uh, shirts and uh, aprons that we give to all our staff. Um, this is something that we, we like to do for, we've been doing a number of years to be able to give them uniforms to wear. Uh, we sent out to a number of uh, local communities and BG Promotions have been doing this for a number of years for us as the only one that came back with a bid and no price increase. Reckon them for the 21, 22 school year. So again, the recommendation is BG Promotions for the apparel, no increase in the motion to approve. Aye. Ours, second Callahan, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. What is all that paper you wrote? Well, I, just in case you want to see bid pricing, but it's massive. And, uh, we do, you know, the, they do a, a very good job of making sure we go through and line item bid by. So just in case you have any questions, I'm going to bring it. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. Good job as usual. Thank you. All right, next item. All right, next item is the 20, 2021 district budget modification. Let me just point out that the board adopts a budget uh, before July 1 of every school year, and then it's modified in December and May, bringing revenues and receipts more in line uh, with closer to what the actuals are. Now, I want to point out that this year, the governor did release about $130 million uh, that he withheld for this year, this current year. What he didn't do is get about $123 million from the previous year, 1920. That money apparently is gone. So right out of our balances, you just take $3 million away. And I don't know, I don't know how they can do that when they say that uh, the, uh, they're flush with cash. Um, that sounds to me like reneging, but uh, I don't think there's anything we can do about it. So the, the budget you have now is improved, but a big part of it being improved is that one-time stimulus money from the federal government. Uh, we would be much better off if he would have uh, released that money from the previous fiscal year. So with that uh, delightful lead-in, Jeff, tell us about your budget modification for May. Okay, members of the board, you 
I did, yes. Okay. So you guys have a hard copy also, and then the electronic copy since last week. Um, every budget has certain requirements that the law that they mandate. Those five parts are it has to have a budget message, it has to have fund balance section, it has to have revenue section, expense section, and outstanding debt. So the budget message really is it's, it's tabbed out there and it's the narrative that describes the summary of changes between this May budget and the December revision. And this section also includes tax rate and assessed valuation history if you're interested. Um, the second section is the fund balance section which shows the balances for all four of the district's major funds and includes a variance page breakdown as well on page four that shows the major changes in revenues and expenditures between this May budget and the December revision. And then we have the revenue section which has the summary and detailed schedules which are by object, by year, and by fund for all of our revenues and those changes. And section four, or the expense section, summary of and detailed schedules that are by object, which is things like salaries and supplies. <clears throat> and then there's another section of expenses which breaks it down by function, or it's kind of by service type, like instructional versus support. And the last section we have is the debt service committee. So, <clears throat> Kind of to summarize the changes in this in this budget revision, our operating balance has increased from 24.3 million or 10.7 percent in December to 30.5 million or 13.4 percent right now, showing in this budget revision. And this is an increase of, of 6.2 million, and it is in line with my earlier estimates that I had provided to the board, provided that we receive all the funding available to us in this fiscal year. Um, that actually represents, we actually in December had a $675,000 deficit, and now with the $6.2 million increase in operating balances, we're at a $5.5 million surplus. <clears throat> this was only possible due to the release of funds that were previously withheld by the governor, Dr. Gray said, for the basic formula, which I'm estimating to be around $3 million increase. <clears throat> Sorry. But more so, this is due to one time money of $6.7 million which we've received or plan to receive this year. And there's still 4.8 million I'm waiting to submit a payment request for that's supposed to be available for G30. There were a couple of decreases in local revenues for food, in food service, which we kind of talked about and alluded to in my um, financial report, and also some additional decreases in student activities and some miscellaneous local. Um, as for expenses, the net changes were minim minimal across all categories, with the biggest reduction being mainly about $750,000 of benefit costs. We've had some vacancies still this year, mostly for the support staff. So a negative seven fifty dollars in benefit costs, but that was offset by an increase in supplies of about $775,000, which is mainly for some additional PPE and um, sanitizing items that we need to just need to go with. In a nutshell, that's kind of the summary of changes for this budget. Anybody have any questions or anything to talk about? But <clears throat> if not, I ask for your approval of the revision. Questions for Mr. Orr? Jeff, will you hear anything about the um, SCR 3 um, Right now, the latest update is, the latest update that I got from the presentation was that they thought the funds might be available around October. But Dr. Bray said he was at a presentation recently and they were talking it may not be until January. So, and that's, I'm estimating that to be around 10.8 million right now based on what we got for SRS2 or our allocation that was provided for SRS2. But we may not see that until January, February or something next year. And whatever we get, we have to set aside 20% <coughs> for recovery activities like I was talking about earlier. So. There will be funds for some of those different uh, activities that we can work with recovery on. So I saw that the governor had approved the supplemental pay request, which will release the Essers 2 money. But he was talking about uh, Essers 3 maybe not being released until uh, January, as late as January. So we'll see. Any other questions? Now I need a motion to approve the district budget modification as presented. 
Powers. second. Callahan, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Next item. Thank you. Next item, uh, you remember at the last meeting, I recommended that the board waive the contingency language for our teachers uh, because the language <laughs> said we have 12% balances in the operating fund uh, by June 30 that um, they will uh, have movement on the salary schedule. That same language was written in our other uh, categories of employees that are negotiated for. So our computer techs, our nurses, our paraprofessionals, and our paraeducators also have contingency language. And I would like to recommend that that language also be waived so that their salary increases can take place next year as well. Motion to approve the recommendation regarding the contingency language. Order. Powers, second, Helms. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Next item. Uh, support staff, um, as we get ready for next school year, I need to get uh, salaries established for our support staff as well. So I'm recommending this evening that we give them a 2.4% increase for all those employees that are not represented by a bargaining agent um, and i'm also recommending if you look through the salary uh, pay plan select um, beginning salaries for certain uh, categories to be upped by between one and two percent because those beginning salaries are getting way out of line with what uh, the is going on in our region so it's a 2.4% increase for all of our staff across the board, our support staff, and then 1% to 2% for beginning salaries for select categories of our support staff to keep them in line, or more in line anyway, with um, our costs for the region. All right. Any questions? Uh, Ready to start? Go ahead. Question. Is that 2.4%, is that in line with the basic increase that was received by yes. the yeah. Yeah. It's, it's right. what the teacher's salary increase calculates out to be across the board. I need a motion to approve the recommendation for the support staff salary fund. Helms? Second. George? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item. Uh, next item is uh, an update on our teacher salary schedule uh, committee. And you know that uh, we've had, oh gosh, I guess it's been for two years now, but we haven't really done much this year due to COVID. Uh, we have a teacher salary schedule that had gotten, uh, needed to have some uh, improvements to it. It had gotten out of whack. Uh, most of the money was in a certain area of the salary schedule. Our uh, beginning teachers, our least veterans, really there wasn't much movement for them at all. It was mostly on the upper side. And um, the board wanted us to look at uh, a salary schedule and see if we could come up with something that was more fair. And we had a committee worked on that a year ago. Jeff, uh, as chief financial officer, had put together a salary schedule that addressed a lot of the shortcomings of our current salary schedule. Um, and I wanted him to update you as to where we are with that plan. Any salary schedule we develop will have to go back uh, to the teachers to uh, negotiate that as far as who goes on the new salary schedule, um, if it's in line with their, their own thinking. Um, so Jeff's worked hard on that and it's been in kind of dormant for quite a while now because of COVID, but um, we want to crank it up again. And this evening, Jeff was going to tell you a little bit about where we are with the salary schedule and then where we're going here. So Jeff, if you take it from there. There's a board in your packet or electronic documents, you have a memo that I put together that kind of outlines what we've done as far as the committee's concerned for salary schedules. I'm going to try and summarize this. We some of the issues that were identified in our current salary schedule where there's what they call super steps, so there's big increases here and there. There's some steps where you don't get a large increase. So we tried to solve all those problems. Plus it only has like 17 steps. Most people want more than which typically kind of represents one year per step, but people typically work longer than that, so there's longevity. So anyway, 
what we the goals that we had in mind when we built this new schedule, this mock schedule, was the ability to maintain competitive salaries, improve raises, steps one through ten, a lot of those salaries are just like four hundred and fifty bucks. So we wanted to improve that. Eliminate super steps. You know, some people they get a ten thousand dollar raise, it takes a lot of money out of schedule, but it's fine. Other people can only get four hundred and fifty. Um, reduce or eliminate longevity, which means get the staff that are on longevity steps now back on the salary schedule and keep them on the schedule until they retire. It was hopefully so. What we did was we took the salary schedule that we currently have, I advanced people on it to come up with this estimate, and then I built a new salary schedule because things had changed in the old one. And using the methodology where we started with BA step one, 41.5 is a base, which is 500 more than we currently have now. And then, as you can see in the memo, we took that and put $1,000 per step to run that out, 30 steps. And from there, we built off of that out towards the rest of the schedule. So each channel, when the next channel was $500 for each step, the next channel, 500 on from the old step. Until we get to MA, then we added 5,000 from the previous channel to those steps. And then from just to the base step, and then we built that out 1350 per step. So we did this to try and stay relatively consistent with similar, or with more people would be lifetime earnings, those kind of things, keeping those in consideration to build out for, for 30 steps. When we move everybody over, typically from steps one through 15-ish, if you move from the step you're on to the new schedule, this new mock schedule, you would get a fairly significant raise. It would be a decent raise. But people above step 15, a lot of those would have to be, for lack of a better way of putting it, to get the same raise they would have gotten on the old schedule or to get some some comparable raise. I had you may have to go from step 15 or 16 to step 20 or 17 or 23, but to put you where you were, would most likely be. So that cost ended up being around $7 million just as a ballpark 7.1 or 6.6% to implement a schedule that was built in this way using this methodology, um, and again, this would just be just for certified staff and the teacher level. There's like 1,540 some people on that schedule, and so 7.1 million or 6.6 percent, and that includes the increase it would take to get there for retirement credit so, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but it's kind of where that has to kind of put an estimate of what it would take to implement that, and that's what it would be just for this group. Of course, we still have the other groups that we would have to look at as well. And so that's that, probably something that we can talk with our teachers association about as to where we where we go from here. But at least you have a a prototype salary schedule that does all those six or seven. Uh, it answers all those questions. May not be to everybody's satisfaction, but it does answer the questions. And so it would be a question of sitting down with our association and see if that's just something we're going to throw out in the next negotiation session or not. But the problem is we we received some stimulus money, but that's one-time money. There's nothing recurring there, so there's no way we could afford this kind of additional expenditure that would be ongoing for years to come. <coughs> with our current not under stream, the current the circumstances yeah, with the current revenue streams that we have that are recurring it's, it's not questions yeah. okay. so Jeff when we ended the conversations 15 months ago it was because of COVID but we hadn't yet from any perspective gotten to the point I think where we were all satisfied is the recommendation here that we should restart those and get through that process or Wait to negotiations. I would think we would want to wait to negotiations. To, I mean, we could meet again, but I mean, I don't know. We would probably have to meet again. If we were going to try and come up with a schedule that would be agreeable to everybody. But then we still have a huge hurdle to meet. But it's still going to have to go back to a it's future happening. board committee. I mean, not not the salary schedule committee, but the actual negotiation process. 
So, but at least we've got something to look at. I think we have the start that answers the questions. So, For my part, I think getting to the point where we have something that seems agreeable on both sides that we understand then how much it costs sooner rather than later would be a big benefit for our negotiations. So we don't have that as a hurdle that stops us. I don't think it would. I don't mean. I don't think it would hurt at all to uh, reconstitute our salary schedule committee and come back together and let Jeff make that the same presentation to the committee. We'll go from there. What do we need to do to get that off? Is it just talk to Jamie and Dana and get the ball rolling again? Okay. We'll do that. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Next item. <coughs> uh, next item at the uh, last school board meeting, we had a parent talk to the board about dyslexia and request that a committee be established um, to take a look at this issue that's becoming more and more pronounced in, in all of schools. So um, we, we met and talked about that. We think it's a, a lot bigger issue than just dyslexia, that it should involve more than just that issue, more of our, of our reading program. So um, at this point, uh, we've talked about making that a board priority, which I would recommend to the school board in, in August, and uh, which would establish a committee to take a look at all aspects of it. Um, Jen, you or Laura want to elaborate on what I've just said? Uh, no, I think you, you covered it. I, I think that um, we'd like to look at all of our processes and um, you know, find a way to make sure we're really communicating what we are doing with parents. Uh, but I, I think it would be good for us to do. I agree. I think it comes back to that triangle again and looking and seeing. Are we, are we hitting a home run with 80% and then what are we doing with the other 20? So I, I agree. I'm pleased to be a part of that. Yeah, any board priority gets attention drawn to the problem or the issue. And that's what we would want to do with this. Maybe we cut down on the number of board priorities so that we can really concentrate on the most important. So that's the way we'd like to proceed if that's all right with you guys. Questions? Comments? I should just add to that. I think the important part, because I had some conversations with Jen and I about it, is that we want to help all of our kids with literacy. We want to make sure everybody's succeeding. And dyslexia is extremely important, but that's a piece of the whole. And so we want to look at the whole instead of just pulling out one piece. Because there's kids who have dysgraphia, there's kids who have all different things, and we want to make sure as a district that we're hitting every child's needs. And dyslexia is a huge part of that, but there's also other things that we want to make sure that we're doing that. So that was kind of the discussions that we had so that we're not leaving anybody out and that we're making sure we're sufficient and, you know, getting the needs. And so I realize we all have a lot on our plates, especially all of you. If we wait till August to set that as a board priority and then operate against it after that, we're talking about getting started in September, October, is there anything that we can do before then to potentially bring recommendations and improvements for the start of next week? I don't know if we can do it justice to try to get something thrown together. I'm not looking for perfection, which is whether or not there's potential options to do some, some good when we start the school year. Let's I take. think that is gathering information. Mm -hmm. The gathering of information, like you know, some of that, you know, like over the summer too, with the admin and you know, getting some of their processes and getting all of that. We do have a large number of teachers engaged in training this summer that will, um, in August, immediately increase our ability to support students specifically um, with dyslexia and others yeah. who struggle to read. Um, and and there are some curriculum things going on this summer as well. I don't want to speak for you, but um, and the number of teachers that we have engaged in letters training. Um, and we have, a, we have 120 signed up for letters training. So I think that's, that, that they will start at the start of the school year with that next year. So 
I, I think a piece of this is really, you know, being transparent about what is going on right now. Um, and I think we could probably get all of that together to start the school year for sure. Um, so we, we would have that available. I know a lot of parents in our community, I know this firsthand, that a lot of parents in our community in our district have done a lot of research on their own and start pulling together information, sure resources, tools, those kind of things. Even getting ourselves into a position where we understand better how to provide other parents that those resources, that information, so that they can start taking some control for their children, I think would be really beneficial to See what we can do. Uh, last thought of Mike is to establish a special end of the year board meeting like we always do. It's the last Monday in June, June 28th um, at 6 o'clock. If that's each of or uh, the final uh, bills for the school district, then I think we also have our insurances that we need to bring back uh, to you uh, for your approval. I have no problems with that. Anybody else have problems with that? Are we good? All right. So I need a motion to establish the special end of year meeting going eight to Monday night, six o'clock. Callahan, second. Powers, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Good work tonight, board. Thank you. <coughs> all right. Um, comments from the board. Mr. Raymond's. Last, <laughs> Sorry, usually last. Um, <laughs> last board meeting of the year. A very interesting year. Never be redone. Hopefully. Um, but just again, thank you to everybody. All the work that you guys have done this year. Um, obviously, it goes for all of our staff. You guys, you've been the way through. Without you and your leadership and the hard work and the hard work of all of our teachers and the parents. So I really appreciate that. Um, doing that. Mr. George, I'd like to echo the same thing. Uh, everybody's working incredibly hard this year to, to try to make it as normal as possible, even under the most adverse circumstances. So, kudos to everybody. Uh, Alexis, thank you very much for being a young person and being engaged. I know. Uh, we were all there at one point, being nervous, speaking in front of everybody. But don't think that's anything that's abnormal. We're all there. But uh, thank you for stepping up and speaking. Uh, I have to second the comments on Alexis and the uh, uh, the organization. Uh, find the light. Uh, it is a need and uh, again I have to comment that uh, the professional and support staff in this school district uh, this last year has been like climbing a mountain with uh, a sack of rocks on your back. So, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Holmes. Uh, thank you as a parent, I want to say thank you, definitely. You know, my kids have really benefited a lot from your leadership and everything you all provide to them. Um, as a board member, I'm new, so uh, I do look forward to learning a lot while I'm here. I'm looking forward to working with you all and doing whatever I can uh, you know, in this position to assist you all to be able to continue to assist the students, families, and you know, parents of our district. Because you know, it's a reason why our district is respected as much as it is, and I think that reason pretty much starts there. So, thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Potts. I want to thank everybody, too, and also, I'm highly impressed with everything that we did, of course, with everybody, I mean, just on every level, stuck up. But then, all the things that we keep accomplishing on the forefront, there's, there's stuff always going, and whether it's you see it right away or not, there's stuff always moving, there's always committees meeting, there's always people with ideas coming to us that we're always working on, and that, I was thinking about it today, that just impresses me so much that through this whole thing, 
our first priority obviously is the kids, but it was we got to make sure they're okay and they get through this okay. We got to keep working on this stuff and making sure everything's good in school. And everybody just stepped up even more. When I thought we can't do anymore, we'd be so tired, everybody just kept pushing. And that's on every level. And so I thank all of you for that from every level from Alexis for speaking up and getting people involved, from Jenna and Laura and Jeremy, everybody. You know, coming up and saying, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. It's so important, and we're not going to stop. I think that sends a strong message that we're not going to stop. We're just going to keep making it better. So thank all of you so much. Awesome. Nice words. Nine days of school. So we're finished strong. Graduations uh, 29th, 28th, and 29th of May. Looking forward to that. So I uh, appreciate you all being here and everything that you do for the district as well. I need a motion for this board to go into closed session. Our oh. second, Callahan, roll call, please. Tom? Yes. Tommy? Yes. John? Yes. Mike? Yes. Erica? Yes. Gabriel? Yes. We'll take a short recess and then reconvene. <laughs> All right, we're back in open session. Any business before the board at this point? If there is none, I need a motion to adjourn. Powers. Powers second Callahan. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you very much.